This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with coach and player development manager at Northampton Saints, Alex O'Dowd. He discusses some of the key indicators for potential high-performance athletes, how to encourage buy-in from coaches to ensure consistency in a programme's pathway, as well as some of the skill acquisition work done within the academy. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week. Right, Alex, we are good to go. Firstly, thank you so much for spending a bit of your Thursday evening with with me and and all the listeners. How are your how things in your world? How are you? Yeah, really good. That's a real, real pleasure to be on here. As I just, I think I mentioned just before we started, you know, quite nervous about this after looking at the, the really excellent people we've had on before, but um, I'll try and share what anything I can. Yeah, things are re- really good. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, as you said, some some amazing guests, which I've been fortunate to talk to. And, and from looking at your profile, you are definitely going to be an exciting one and one that everyone will really enjoy listening to. I think as a starting point, do you just want to explain to people who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. I probably I probably start at the at the at the end and then move backwards probably is the easiest way. So currently I'm a academy development manager at Northampton Saints. And uh, that role I look after our sort of pathway between under 14 through to under 16s around development programs, talent ID, um, and I coach across our 16s through to our 18s as well. So that's my, my bit of my coaching head I get on the grass. Uh, and I'm also responsible for our coach development across the club. And, you know, we, we, we cover a vast region, around 50-odd coaches within, 50-plus coaches internally and externally within the organisation that I that I sort of talk about, not so much development, I, I talk about engagement more than development with them. Um and which we can talk about a little bit later on. And then uh, prior to that, I came over to the UK uh, to work at Nottingham University, uh, sorry, Not- Nottingham Trent University, uh, and with Nottingham Rugby in the Championship. Actually uh, got recruited by Ian Costello, one of your previous guests. So I had the pleasure of working with Cosy for a couple of years um, alongside uh, Neil Falks um, and, and ran the NTU rugby program in conjunction with our working in the, the championship with um, Nottingham. And prior to that, I was uh, been in New Zealand, uh, was uh, academy manager and um, assistant coach with North Harbour Rugby in the NPC uh, in New Zealand. Did that for three years. And uh, all in all, I've been coaching um, for over close on 23, 24 years now. So I think in... Uh, as an amateur and and more recently obviously professionally um, and getting paid for it which is fantastic um, and I'm probably thinking looking back I remember I was just thinking about this before I've probably been involved in coaching a team probably nearly every year over those years at various levels and various age ages um, and also I have a bit of a cricket background so I've also you know coached across other sports and been involved with coaching cricket previously as well which is you know, has has a different uh, perspective to rugby, but um, really enjoying my, my time in rugby at the moment. Yeah, and I think no mean feat to be able to stay on the grass with uh, when you're in a leadership role. I have it a little bit with with my job, which at times stuff tries to drag you away. So the fact that you're still able to get on the grass is really good work because it's kind of you have to a lot a bit of time to do that. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I guess your upbringing, you mentioned New Zealand and stuff. I guess, could you just describe to listeners what is the culture of rugby in New Zealand like? Um, and then from when you've come over here, how is it the same or how is it different? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I liken New Zealand rugby to, you know, it's the national sport. Um, I, I, I liken rugby to the fact that um, rugby is something you grow up with. You know, you you, you play with a, with a ball in the backyard as a kid, you, you jump over the fence and want to play rugby with your next door neighbour one-on-one or you head down the park and you kick a ball around. So it's, it's sort of in, in, ingrained in our culture. 
um, just I suppose like footballers across some of the South American countries and and obviously um, here in the UK with football and in Europe. So um, it's probably much a, a, a freestyle approach. It's just grab a ball, get down there and play and um, and enjoy yourself and, and and see where it takes you sort of culture. Um, I probably find coming to the UK I came over obviously the, uh, a lot later after many years in New Zealand. Um, I found there's a real passion for the sport here and um, and, and there's a real um, enjoyment in playing rugby. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a, it's, it's a very big sport in the UK as well, obviously. You know, numbers are large, but in terms of a difference in culture, I would just probably think that it's that natural ability where you, you, you usually probably pick up a rugby ball. Here you'll probably pick up a football um, or, or some other... Uh, other sport as opposed to being the first thing you pick up as a rugby ball. I, I think that's probably the probably the major distinction I've probably seen. Yeah, I think it's a it's a fascinating distinction between those areas because, um, it, like the skills that you pick up from the informal play are quite a big one. But I also remember being in school, and the minute we got to secondary school and were allowed to do full ta- full contact rugby, there was a bit of a buzz around the place. Yeah. So whilst it's not necessarily like the first sport that everyone goes to, it seems in the UK at least that everyone's aware of it and there's mm-hmm. an intrigue to go and play it, which I'd imagine, as you said, that high participation number probably has something to do about that because everyone knows that it's there and it, it, it inter- there's interest constantly. Yeah, and I think, I think through New Zealand over the years, there's been a challenge to keep you know, young adults playing the sport. Um, in the, in the girls' game, that's increased in numbers um, considerably in New Zealand, and, and, and it, which is great to see. Um, but there's probably been like like most sports and changing um, change not changing demographics, but changing um, what, what's the word I'd look for is um, things to do socially around um, other activities, which means it's really difficult. And other sports being short format sports and um, injury potentially but you know there's other sports that people are um, you know young young adults are looking to play so it's a, it's a challenge everywhere to keep keep people involved in your sport but um, and I, that's where I think the, the main point around that is is your sport's got to be enjoyable it's, it's got to be something that you know um, I, I, I think about destination shopping you know you go to a place to go to a destination to because you, you want to shop there you know it's the same as the same as a sport if you if you really enjoy it you're going to want to do it and I think that's re- the, the most important thing and I think and, and you know people pick up a rugby ball just to play because they just want to go out and play and that, and that's really really important um, to not lose that passion for your sport yeah no 100 you have to maintain that all the way through the path pathways that you're a part of yeah if we now shift that um i guess to your your current role within northampton can you just explain to us i guess what the pathway for a northampton academy player would look like right so i mean obviously it, it, we, we we are governed by um in conjunction with with the rfu and um in terms of our academy and programs so all the premiership clubs will follow a similar uh, well very much the same system I suppose the difference is 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 how you what emphasis you put in certain areas within your pathway. So our path at the moment we we have a pathway between our our developing player pathway of around five hundred players across fourteen through to sixteens, and then we would go up our our, our pathway um, into sixteens, seventeens, and eighteens, and and obviously they get smaller and smaller as you go on but I think at the moment our, our focus is very much deep and wide in terms of our pathway um, so we we have a real process around um, how to keep people in it as opposed to to, to to how to get to move people out of it um, and I think that that's you know it can be a you know a lot of people aren't, aren't, aren't happy with the word pathway but it, I think it's really depends on how you you use it and then what what way you try and engage your athlete to ensure that it it, it can be a really really enjoyable um, process for them um, and, and an enjoyable journey and, and an adventure and that's really how we treat it with most of our well not most with all of our players that are within our pathway so we have around four centres across our region and and they they'll all look after age groups from 14 15 16 so we have you know plethora of coaches across that those, that region um, who get up their time um, to be involved in our pathway, um, and then right through 
up to our 16s, 17s and 18s, we we slowly bring that into to two centres and then into one centre as it currently stands. So um, it's quite a major process, um, but it's it's like anything, it's, it's based around the people you have involved in it. And I think we have really, really good people involved with, within our pathway. And it's, it's led really well by our academy manager, Mark Hopley. So in, in terms of how we try and develop our players, I'm, I'm happy to talk around that and what we do. But um, I think the underlying thing is enjoyment and making sure that our players um, come out at the other end, you know, a better player. A better player and really want to keep playing the sport and I think oh, I think that's that's part of what success to us looks like yeah I'm, I'm picking up on something you said there Arch I, I agree with before I ask the question but it's quite an interesting one around the keeping it quite broad in terms of having a lot of players in the system there's people that I would have worked with previously or speak to that will say kind of go down the elitist route of no we want best v best and we're going to try and get all the players in one place so they you know game rub off one another and they are able to you know pick the ideas of the best players around them what are the benefits you've seen by keeping I guess the 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 pathway itself relatively broad and giving access to more players rather than going that down that specific quite narrow route uh well well, obviously you know telling ideas is an unbelievably complex process and and anyone who says they can pick a 14 year old um to be the next World class rugby player is, you know, I, I wouldn't I'm not saying I disagree with them, but I challenge their their process around that. I mean, we probably all can see close to it the gold the gold nugget, but it's such a late developing sport. Rugby, you know, you have you have um, various, you know, you have your maturations, you have your relative age effect. You know, you have lads who might be in the same age, early quartile, late in the year, you know, who'll grow at different places, but could have different age, uh, physical and um, biological size of two and a half years, even though they're the same age. So, you know, you've, you've got to look at potential and, and, and that's a very difficult thing to, to, to look after um, and try and develop. Um, but, you know, we see, we see a change you know, year to year on players. You know, some players develop two or three years down the track. Some will take a different path and come back in because they're, they're, they've taken a different route into the pathway. It has to be very fluid. So um, to ensure that, you know, you, you're you not missing everyone or you're not missing the, the ones that potentially could go on and be a professional rugby player, you have to keep it reasonably deep and you have to keep it reasonably wide. Um, and and then you've got to look at how you challenge those players within that program to 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 be better every day, every every week, every season as they as they as they physically change, as they mature, as they as their skills develop. Um, and so that's really really important to do that. Um, and and then it's how you challenge some of those better players as they're developing faster than others, um, and giving them the appropriate challenge to make sure that they're able to. To develop their skill at a higher rate, and and um, you know, I've looked at, you know, we talk a lot around this at the club, but you you know, I've looked at the difference in the in the cricket scenario where you know you've you've got the young lad who can't hit the ball off the square, but actually has a really really good technique, and the only reason he's not hitting fours and sixes is because he's a bit smaller, and 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 he has the potential to do that as he gets a bit taller, a bit stronger, and develops himself physically. Where you might have a big lad who's not quite as technically attuned to this game but you know can really put the ball over the rope you know quite easily but they change and and you and you just have to work with those players and make sure that um you, you've got the process along the way to keep a tab on where they're at and what does that look like um and, and it's a difficult one to measure but we you know we, we we try and look at what what every how players develop over certain periods through our program and and um, which is player driven, which is another thing that's very interesting, which we find not so much interesting, but I think it's really important the player drives their learning, just like coaches. So um, there's little metrics that we will look at um, along our, our pathway to see where players are developing. Um, and, and a lot of that is through educating our coaches as well, because that's really, really important because they'll have most of the eyes over the players over a longer period of time than myself or some of the other academy staff were traveling around just watching snapshots or, or, or 
of a player's ability. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a process that is um, um, for us is, is is ongoing. And as I say, it has to be incredibly fluid. You, you have to allow players to come in and out, or stay or develop, and give them that opportunity to grow and and create a real positive environment, learning environment for them to get better. And that that's probably key for us. And um, one last question around this before I segue slightly. How do you allow that fluidity without ill feeling? Because, you know, I, I've worked in academy football for long enough to know that when players get deselected or not pushed across age groups or a variety of other things, people at times can feel like their their child is being held back or has not been afforded opportunities that someone else is being so how do you go around keeping the fluidity in that process where you are essentially encouraging the players and their parents to understand that it's their individual journey and that you're going to be going off on segways constantly but just to focus on yourself yeah i think i think there's two points to that the first thing is that um and once you're in you're in it for a season so you you get that you get that particular understanding and confidence and safety to be able to go and make mistakes and develop yourself. Um, so so players know that when they're in, they're in. The second thing is that we also we are fluid in the sense that we're always watching players, we're talking to our coaches, and if players are developing, miss out at one stage and three or four or two months down the track, the, the coach comes back and says, look, he's doing really well. We bring them in and we give them opportunities to see where we're at because we don't get it right all the time and we're not, we don't profess that we get it right all the time. But what we do do is try and open, keep the door always open and it's uh, available for players to say, well, actually, yeah, look, he's changed. He can come in. We do it every year as well. So it's not ongoing during the season for players coming in. It's also at the end of each season, you know, you come back, has he developed at a particular rate? Um, is he showing good, good level of development? Um, yes. Well, he's probably going to continue on to the next stage. Has someone who didn't make the program, because it probably wasn't right for them at that particular time. Have they improved physically, uh, mentally mature? Actually, and what's their rugby look like? Well, it's actually really good. Now's a great opportunity for them to enter at that particular stage. So you have to keep that process fluid. And that's the only way we can do that is by really trying to communicate that to parents and, and then and trying to ensure that they are very supportive and understand that the door is never closed. People take so many different pathways into professional sports. And it's not an easy place to, to to make, you know. It's you know, it's a profession where only a few percentages get through. And but we understand that, but at the same time, we're not just looking at that, we're looking at how can we develop players and people that actually want to continue playing rugby when they get to 18, 19 and head off and have had a really good experience and just developed themselves and got better rugby player. That's also, I think, a really important part of, of what we try and achieve with our players. I think what's interesting as well, and Southampton have been good at this historically, is having players that you can benchmark that are in your first team or have progressed on that have been through that route. And I know for yeah. Northampton, you know, you have quite a lot of success of getting homegrown players into your first team setup and they've gone on to progress and play for England or yeah. national teams. So I imagine that's quite a nice point to say, listen, Courtney Laws might have gone through a similar program where he was deselected or, or went down for two months, come back up or whatever it is. You've kind of got that vision and person you can stick on the wall to say, listen, it, it isn't just your son. It is for their best benefit at this moment in time. And look, there's examples of how we've helped them have success along the way. Yeah, and 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 a hundred percent. And I think if you spoke to Mark regarding that, you know, he'd tell you prior, prior to my time, and he was, you know, there's been several players that have come through slowly or slow burners and then they've just sort of taken off at that point where they've actually thought right well we, we let's see where we can where, where where they can go in the professional environment and and uh, and 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 have gone on to do really really well and these players in the environments that have been have had different journeys have gone out and come back in and we're able to probably you know we are able to sort of communicate that to our to our to our um, rugby community and, and parents. So I think they do see that. Um, and I think it's really important, as I say, that we don't discard people um, forever. You know, it's 
it, it's it's we try and put it down at this moment in time you are not in the program but it, that doesn't mean in two days time that they have changed or in a month's time or two months time i mean obviously you know i'm a bit accentuating a little bit there but you know uh, you know you'd be looking over a certain period of time you'd come back and say well yeah there's been development there um and and you and you're showing um that it's something you want to do as well so you have to be you know you really want to be in it um and if they are showing that sort of development then you know um we we give them an opportunity and i think that that's then it's up to them where they take that opportunity and how and how much they want to learn and get better so one of the things you mentioned earlier was around potential and trying to identify potential. And I agree with you. I think it's one of the hardest roles of anyone in sport to kind of say, oh, this player has potential. I think you're quite fortunate in terms of you've obviously got a lot of experience. You've gone over a couple of sports as well as um, been in, in different uh, countries and able to see that. Is there anything in your experience that's either measurable or that you use as a key identifier for someone that you think has high potential? That's a really good question. And um, for me, I think it comes down to a really um, a real ability to to want to get better. So someone who has a real mindset of um when you want to be challenged but they want they want to, to get better every day so and, and for young young players that they may not realize they're they're striving to be better or not being able to articulate it to a coach or senior but you can just see by the way that they that when they play they want to get their hands on the ball they want to get involved in the game they work hard they communicate really well to people around them you know they're they're they've got a bit of um, a team mentality as well in the team sport, but they also have that sort of ability to, to make things happen around them. And um, those are sort of things. I mean, when we watch players, the big thing I talk to Mike, the coaches that I deal with is when I'm watching players and I, I did a, you know, did a three years um, as a talent spotter for New Zealand rugby. It's part of the under 20 program, you know, back in 2011 and 12 and 13. And, and, and one of the things I was always that struck me when we were talking about potential at that stage was, you know, it was a different level, 1918, 18, 19 level, but I've brought it down into to looking at 16, 17, 15 year olds is anyone who has a real desire to get involved in the game without taking over from other players, for me, shows that they've got a real willingness. One, that they've probably got a really good work rate. And I'll just keep going and keep going. And two, they've probably got a little bit of a, an eye for what's happening around them. So their situational awareness allows them to be able to be in places to get their hands on the ball. And so those are the things that I look for as opposed to their core fundamental skills. So are, are they are they got are they able to move really well? You know, have, have they got a natural ability to catch a ball and, and move it across their body? Um, are they able to sort of play with their heads up and see things in front of them. And, and they may not even realise they're doing it, but they're just natural things you see with players. Um, and, and then it's just a match. So those are sort of the, I mean, I know it's not one particular thing, but it's a it's a variety of things that I put, you know, that I probably myself look at when I'm looking at players. Um, and then it's, and then it's, if they're really, you know, Young young players aren't going to come up to you and say, you know, some will say, well, how can I be better tomorrow? What are the things I need to do? And they want instant feedback. And it, it might be for me, it's like, well, just go away and have a think about yourself. How did you think you went? And what were the things that you enjoyed about the session? And what were the things you learned? And then then come back next week and talk to me about it. And then you get an understanding of they, they're able to go away and, uh, and assimilate the information that they've had and, and understand what the game was like. And then they come back and say, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed the fact that we were able to move the ball quickly and I got into positions to, to find space or um, I got into positions to make really good good tackles or get my hands on the ball. So that, things like that. So give them time to go away and have a little bit of a think about it themselves. And then when they come back and they're, they're able to uh, potentially articulate those things, you think, yeah, okay, this... This person's thinking about this place, thinking about the game. They're thinking about what, how they were involved in the game. They're thinking about things around them, and I think that's quite important. I've seen that in sport, as well, in other sports, cricket specifically, when you've got an individual sport within a team game. So you get a batter who's able to 
to understand how you how you win games as opposed to stats. If that makes sense, you know, so players, a lot of players and batters will go out and you know, they'll, they'll be very stats driven, but actually how many games are they winning, you know, and, and what's the situation around, I need a quick 20 here to win the game, or I, I really need a dogged, really patient, you know, 35 to, to win us the game here. And having that sort of understanding, of, you know, and you do see that in young, you do see that in young players. And I think then when you see those sorts of qualities, I think you can then think around how the things we're going to hone these skills to be able to develop them and their decision making around that to be able to, to grow and how important the coach plays in that part of that development as well is really important. Yeah, I, I really like the line you use there around affecting the game, but not at the negative expense of teammates, because yeah. particularly a you know a team based sport that at the younger age groups can be the case where it's the kid who wants to score all the goals or wants to just be in that position at all times. But actually, more often than not, if they're capable of playing in the hardest positions or perceived hardest positions, they will still be able to affect the game elsewhere. So mm. that kind of situational awareness mm. of what the team needs at that moment in time or what they need to do to have success at that moment in time and then you can combine it with, I guess, all the measurable bits in terms of how how fast they can run, how high they can jump, physically what they're able to do. But I think as an eye test, that's a really nice, simplistic way of describing it. Yeah, I think so because because when you when you're watching players, you get you you get a little bit of the the, the clickbait type sort of um, selection process, and I think that's really really difficult for coaches to to get through and understand you know because we you know you see you see games where players will come in out of the game and they'll do some high profile things which you think are fantastic but it's actually watching players you know and it's a very very difficult thing to do is go and watch a game and just go and watch a particular player especially when you don't know it's easy when you know you're going to go and watch someone but it's difficult when you're watching a group and thinking who's going to stand out here so and how am I going to pick the best players well not the best players but who am I going to but how am I going to pick players that potentially look like they are, are, are working well and have some really good skill set? And you look at those things around um, players that come into your eye all the time, and that's how I see it in that situation, because you see them, oh, he's popped up again, and um, oh, he's on the ball here again, yeah, okay, and oh, look, he's linked really well to put that guy in space, and oh, he's worked, he worked really hard around there. He hasn't got the ball, but he's created an opportunity for someone else just because he's there. You know, but it's gone somewhere else. And you're thinking, actually, they that that's how you, you 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 pick those those players up, and you have to look at their core skills, obviously, and and the way they move and their, their, their fundamentals, which we do a lot on. And I suppose that's a little bit around. We don't do a lot around position specifics throughout football. Well, we don't do anything around positions from 14s to 16s in our in, in that part of the pathway. It's um it's all about your skill fundamentals and how hard you work and and getting an understanding of game awareness. So that's that's something that we we you know we do we do a lot of with players at that age. And so how does that translate? Because I imagine, you know, when they do then get a bit older and there's going to be certain things like scrummaging, which um is important or increasingly is coming important, the ability to catch a high ball or things like that. How do you manage drip feed in those types of things in because you might be in a situation where if you haven't gone position specific up until the age of 16 17 if they're then playing first team rugby at 18 19 they've only got experience of it for a couple of years yeah i think i think um just a couple of things around that is like most of the players are, are playing club or school so they are in positions and they are and they are honing their crafts in that particular area. But for us, it's really important around the fact that um, maturation plays a big part and physical development is going to change. And your, your, phys your physical pillar is, you know, your ticket to play, as we as we talk around in the professional game. You have to you have that has to be there. But, you know, you might change physically. So as you so they are getting they are getting you know, position-specific stuff within their club and schools, then it's, a, a, as we move through the pathway, they'll, they'll, they will be getting um, exposure to, you know, um, scrum work and scrum shape or a, a hook of throwing or, or, or lifting techniques and, and what does that look like? Or if you're a, if you're, um, a winger, it might 
be a little bit of high ball catching or a back three player catching a high ball. You know, we will incorporate that into 16s, but we keep it reasonably general around that. So, you know, if, if, so that players can can develop skills because we don't know where they would potentially will be if they're going to come into a professional environment. What what actually, what will they be? What will be the key position? But so what's really important is that they're all got really good rugby ability. And if they've got really good rugby ability, then you're going to be able to, to layer on through the ages the specifics around their position. Um, and, and, and then on, on top of that, obviously, you've got to look at the physical component of, of, of those particular positions and what that may look like moving down the track. So um, you might have um, you know, a, a front rower who, who is quite tall and long and big neck, but actually, well, you know, I'm not a front row expert for, by any means, and the people listening listeners probably think, what's he talking about? But, um, you know, he, he, does, he might not have, he might not physically be able to play that in the, in the future, whereas he might be more used to a back row, back row role, or he might be, you know, in that position where he's probably not going to be in the back row and, and the front row might be somewhere for him. It might be, he's a winger who's incredibly fast and he's got a great pass and, well, it was not, he's not fast enough, but he's got a really good pass. Nine might be a, a, a position where he's going to be very explosive. So you just got to put them in those situations, hone their skills, create their rugby ability. And then those things for us, I think, probably evolve quite easily over time. Um, and we do, obviously, we do put a lot of work into players through the pathway at, further up around um, the core dynamics of each position. Um, at, at, but it's probably not the major priority, if I, if I was to put it that way. That's the best use of school and county uh, sport that I've thought of. And we don't, well, I, that I'm aware, we don't think about that in football. So I'm actually going to go and ask our kids when I see them tomorrow where they play for their school teams because I do with the younger ones but we we always talk about the the children at our ages being able to have 360 degree ability to be able to receive with people yeah. around them at all times mm. I'd be really interested to see how many of them actually in school and county games play central areas or central midfield where they have that because if we're trying to shoehorn short shoehorn them in with us it might be that actually they were already playing 15 to 20 games a season in central areas, just in a different environment. So yeah, yeah. that's, that's one that I'm now, I'm going to go back and ask because I'd be really well, interested it's, to see what it's that It's really looks interesting. Like. You know, football, football is about um, being able to control the ball as an extension to your foot really, isn't it? It's, it's, and, and it's been able to have that ability to look after the ball and, and it's as if it's connected to your foot. You know, you can go anywhere with it. You don't even need to be looking at it. You're, you're looking at what's around you because you've got control of it. So if that's the primary primary point of um, move, moving forward with the sport, then the position around, you know, power in the shot, his ability and speed down the flanks or his height to be able to get up and clear, those things will evolve over time. But if he, if he doesn't have the ability to to look after the ball of his feet, he's probably not going to make in the football. Would that be, would that be a fair assumption or? Yeah, relatively fair. I think you yeah. might get the, the occasional abnorm uh, anomaly who's uh, just such a physical freak that they're able to yeah. not do that because they provide you so much aspects elsewhere. But for the most yeah. part, if you can't control the football, you're going to really struggle. <laughs> And I'd say some of the, you know, we, we will have players that you know are going to play in a particular position. So I'm not saying it's a blanket thing that we look at, but it's, it's, it's players are getting position specific play probably every, you know, a Saturday with their schools or Sundays with their clubs or a midweek game with their schools. And so they are getting exposure to positions. Um, it's just a matter of, just putting the jigsaw pieces together over the years on and where they, they might best fit into your into your 15 or into your 23 into your eight in the, in, in the forward pack or your, your seven in the back on where where their skill set's going to be best placed and i think that that's um you know it's 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 probably not rushing it too early because of because it is a late developing sport physically as well so um it's it's, it's just making sure as i say go back to do they have a really good rugby ability you know, do they have really good core rugby skills, and are they and do they work really hard? Which is sort of you know people talk about hard work, but it's just a non-negotiable for anyone who wants to to be the best at anything. It's it's a non-negotiable. No, hundred percent agree. If you want to get better at anything, you've got to put in some hard yards with yeah. it. Um, 
I guess linking onto this then and a little bit around your coach development work before before we pack up. Um, if I were to come and watch Northampton Saints Academy sides, what would I expect to see as a as a style of play or a philosophy of play? And then from you in your coach development piece, how do you get buy-in from 50 members of staff who have all got their own experiences and maybe your own ideas of how the game should be played? How do you get buy-in to go, no, it's imperative that we give them the similar experience or steps across the pathway to hopefully give them the best opportunity? So I'll start with the second point first. I think with our coaches, it's it's for me, it's it's including them in the process. So the the, the things that are really important for, for our coaches is um, I want coaches in our pathway that are willing to get better. They don't have to be... I, I, I'm not after I'm not after you know um, an international rugby coach or or a first team professional coach within a premiership environment. I'm after the coach that is really really keen to develop themselves and get better. So um, if they, if they start with that open mindset, then the next part of getting them to buy into how we want to do things and how they coach is probably easy um, because they are open to it. Um, and most, and, and I'd say we've got a fantastic group of coaches. Um, as I say, they're voluntary coaches, most of them, and and they really, really do want to get better across our pathway. Um, so we we try and do as much as we can around. So that's why I talk about the the, the development. You know, it's engaging them. That's probably my point. But you know, we, I, I want them all to own their learning. That's really important for me. Is that you own your learning? I I can't develop fifty three coaches individually. What I can do is provide you opportunities and provide you with people who are leading your areas to give you opportunities to, to own your learning. So we, we try and talk around, um, we, we give them as much information around what we like, the session design, our session design. What does that look like? What sort of environment's key for us, for you to, to, to one, be better as a coach and also make our players better. So if you, if you're able to um, create that environment then that's really important. We've done a lot of work around their behaviours. So if I come and watch them coach, what are the behaviours I'm going to see? And is that reflected in the type of um, play I'm seeing in the, in the training sessions? So um, we've done a lot of work around that with our coaches and, and, and talking to them about that. And, and, and environment is key. And so if, if they can create a really enjoyable learning environment, then they probably, we have... A, a, a lot of buy-in from our coaches if that makes sense um so so we encourage our coaches to develop environments where they make the best session so we'll give them the session design but i we have a framework over over the six to eight months that they work to the session is designed a particular way of how we want to play and i can talk about that around how we want to play but it's up to them to follow the content but put it into how they want it to work so we've done a lot of work on how they coach um how they coach together. So uh, if we've got two or three or four coaches that are really wanting to learn, they'll work well together. So how well do they co-coach together? Um, and I want them coaching, if that makes sense. So I give them, I want them to be, I want them to coach. So in games, I don't want them just to facilitate. I want them to, if these games, what are the things that they're, how are they checking for learning? How are they looking at technical, tactical um techniques within the game and, and coach it you know don't be afraid to coach and, and work across the coaching continuum sometimes you have to be a little bit you know direct at the other end you might be a lot of peer to peer you know well, great we'll talk to john he will tell joe what he's doing so we we try and create that environment for them to make mistakes just like we want our players to make mistakes and then i think most of our coaches realize then um that it's an environment then for them to think, well, actually, we're genuinely keen to get them better. And and I'm, I've seen a lot of pathways over the years, or if you want to call it a pathway, but I've seen lots of programs over the, over the years where coaches get worried about where they're going next. I just want them to realise that they play such a massive, important part in the process. And I don't think we communicate that as well as we can do sport in general. You know, I think football you know looks at you've got a lot of layers around your coaches and which areas they go into you you're an expert at this area then you go up another level we we try and bring that sort of 
philosophy to our coaches say you know you, what you do in this particular area is really really important you know it's really really important in the development of this particular player and then we you'll see that down the tracks you know you'll be able to come to franklin's gardens and hopefully see a player that you've you've had involvement with five years ago in making his debut or you know performing really well and going on to international rugby so that's really important if, and we try and encourage them that those are the things that we want them to understand and 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 then we'll try and do what we can to develop them so you know i'm out every wednesday watching them coach talking to the coaches seeing different uh, different uh, environments and i'm not telling what to do or, what, or how uh, you know and i'm not saying well why would you do that i'm more wanting them to make mistakes um, and then I want them as groups to talk. And they are fantastic at the way they reflect as groups around how session went, what didn't go well. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a long-winded answer for you, but, <laughs> but it gives you an understanding of where we want to get with our environment. If you came to watch us play, you know, I think, and that's where our behaviour's coming, I think we we want to play, you know, a high-paced, high-tempo, skillful game. You know, we want our players to be re incredibly skillful. So um, I'd like to think that you'd see... Um, you know, a fast game, um, lots of ball movement, um, a lot of hard work, a lot of guys working really hard to, to, to play um, a fast game, you know, high tempo. That's probably what you want to do, and that's probably why we just want our boys. You just have to get really good skill level around that. So our coaches are really trying to develop that skill level within those players so that it allows them to, to go and make those. And you'll, you'll, they'll make a lot of mistakes playing like that. But that's fine. That's absolutely fine. We want them to be part of one of our one of our values is ambition. So we want our players to play with ambition. You know, I don't talk about risk or we don't talk about risk and we talk about can you play with ambition? And what does that look like? You know, so um, if I made that offload and you if you break that tackle and you score, we're not gonna pull you back and go, well, why did you make that offload? If you drop that offload with the intentions to go through and score and you're doing everything right, but you just drop it. Well, that, that happens. We're quite happy with that. So those are the sort of things you'd like to think that we you'd see if you came to watch us play. Yeah, I'm quite glad that you did it that way around because I think what's really nice is you can see the direct transfer of how you want them to coach to how you want to play. Because if you're going in and asking them to, you know, as coach and staff to be brave and make mistakes and, understand that yeah you've got a framework you're going to work within but you can kind of take a level of ownership of of what the sessions actually look like within that framework and that directly translates to what you've just said about the playing style which is you're going to have a team framework which you're going to work in but we want you to be ambitious to what that could look like and how we're going to try and play so yeah. I think that if, if that's being transferred to your coaches, it's then a really easy transfer to the players because the coaches know what it feels like because they're yeah. part of it and then yeah. they can transfer it on. Whereas if you're going around going being dictatorial, going, it has to look like this, you have to have this, you has to do this, and then you're asking the players to be creative, there's a disjointing of the of the, I guess, the entire process. I think I think there's a really you know so so everything that we do around that's underpinned by your fundamentals though so your skill level's got to be good you've got to be technically really strong so we've got to make sure our coaches understand how they can develop technique with their players and and then take that away isolate it bring it back into games small sided games where they get lots of touches um, and then into wider games where they're making bigger decisions and, and and seeing bigger pictures so it's really important our sessions look like that but it's, and that's why I say I want our coaches coaching not just facilitating those games because a lot of times I've seen you know, there's a lot you know a lot of things where you can facilitate and you're letting them play but actually you also need to be coaching in that and then it's how you do that that's really important for our coaches to understand how they do that uh, and and we do a bit of work around you know what what's it questioning and at the end of the day it's got to be very simple and clear so just clarity of message um, and consistency of message is really important with our coaches so um Try not to overcomplicate it. Keep it simple. And everything that you do is also underpinned with enjoyment. So that session, that session of the, for that week has to be, we challenge our coaches to be, is that the best session of the week for the boys? Is it the most enjoyable? And I, I say to the players, you know, if you go home, the only question I want mum or dad to ask you is, was that the most, did you enjoy it? And if they say yes, great. If they say no, then I want to know why. 
why they didn't and then we can we can address that down the track somewhere so yeah. no it makes sense i'm conscious of time so i'm just going to ask you what one question on, on sure. what you said there you mentioned around coaching technique now um unfortunately for the podcast i have to go on social media and it's a hot topic of conversation at the moment around skill acquisition of how much of it is done in block repetitive type practices and how much is done in a contextualized ecological uh, ecological dynamics type space for you guys when you're doing that is it a mixture of both is there one that you lean more heavily uh, heavily towards uh not really i think i think the biggest thing for us is around um, putting players in situations where they make as many decisions as possible all the time, and then they will, uh, and then and then taking it out and and doing work around breaking the skill down and and, and building it back up. And I know there'll be loads of people who agree or disagree, and I, and that's fine. I have no I have no problems with that. But we we will we'll take the way and try and um, and and try and break that skill down and I'm not saying that you do it this way is right or you do it that way or you might catch it like that but I think you need to have some fundamental base to work from to understand it it's um and then it's then situationally how much time and and decisions you make around whether you're able to execute that skill under pressure and 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 time and space pressure and then if you put players in those positions as much as possible having to make decisions then that's probably the biggest thing we will do with our players um, uh, around that technique. But I, I do want our coaches to understand, you know, if if it's if if a player is not running onto the ball and he's not able to get the ball early and get it in out of his hands, why, you know, and then and 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 if there is, an, and it might just be the situation he's in, it might be the fact that he's his body movement, his mechanics aren't right, and and. It, and, it, and he needs to change that a little bit or develop that to make it a better for him or her, then then they have to try and look at that. It may be that he's executing it all the time. You know, um, I look back over the last 10 years in this around this, and I, and, and, and I see it a bit like um, a number one hit in the, in the 80s being remixed in the... <laughs> In the in the 2020s, you know, there's a lot of the same stuff coming back around over 25 years of coaching, but it's just with a different twist to it, and it's just been remixed, and it's but it's very much the same fundamental is there, but it's just put a new spin on it, and and I think for a lot of our technique coaching, I think it's really important that they do are able to take a play away and you know we'll do we'll do we'll do you know um, hole part hole or we'll, we'll put it into a situation where they have to go off and do repetition but i think in those repetition uh elements there will always be elements of decision making because that's probably the generally the hardest thing to develop and and yeah and there'll be far more um experienced coaches out there than me that will have probably far better understanding of it as, as well as I do I can only put it into the context that we do it in and and um and that's where we that's where we try and start that's the starting point for us it sounds like a sensible approach and one that uh, I use or we use as well so I think from from my perspective yeah, I understand the whole having decision making having the part of it's got to be in game but I think there are times purely just for a focus it allows the players to focus in on the skill rather than worrying about the scan and the, 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 all the other bits that go around it. And I liken it at points to reading Harry Potter. Um, it's one of those where you wouldn't ask a young child who's le learning how to read just to go and read Harry Potter. You'd give them little nudges at other points to go, well, an E and an A together makes this sound or yeah. in this certain name looks like this. So for me, it's, yeah, we want to give them Harry Potter to go and read. We want that first and love of, of the game and reading. But at points, we're going to drop them out and go, right, we can see you're struggling in this. Maybe consider this is what it looks like in isolation. Now, can you identify this back in Harry Potter and use it in the right context? Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk to, exactly, and we'll talk to our coaches around, you know, skill with no pressure. Uh, you know, can you add pressure? Then can you add a little bit more pressure with a decision, then can you add multiple decisions? And and then you've got, you know, then you can go back and look at was the skill in isolation very, very good. But now when you're adding decision making to it and multiple options, how good is that skill now? 
well, actually, um, it could be a potentially that the skill's really good, but he just doesn't see the decisions are there, or in his or her particular mind are only seeing certain things. And and that's how you peel that back again and go, okay, well, how can we just build that up again? And and you might have to take that away and do it, you know. So um I think it's it, it, the Harry Potter analogy is a really important one. Learning a language, it's a learning instrument. You know, you have to learn the, you have to learn the, you have to learn the notes, and how, and then you, know, you can't get thrown into to you know Mozart concerto if you as a lead violinist if you don't understand an A B and an E and a D <laughs> and how to do it. So I think that it's 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 really important that our coaches work through that. And I think for players moving up the chain and for coach up the chain, it's having really deep technical understanding around that um, and being able to then impart that or not impart it, but able to be able to sit back and go, okay, I don't need to go over three weeks of analysis. I can see it there and then, right there and then. And I can work out how I'm going to correct or that or, or, or aid that development. So I'm um, well, in a nutshell, we try and do that with our coaches, and um, hopefully they, they think that that's where they're at and where we're getting to. Um, um, and hopefully our players are having that mindset that they want to get better as well. Perfect. So last question for me, which is something I ask everyone. If I were to speak to the coaches you work with or the players that you work with, how would you hope they described you in three words and why? Yeah, and uh, I would probably say um, energetic, talkative, communicator. But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I always go with how would you hope? Because I think yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice thing of actually how would you want to be perceived by the people that you're trying to affect? And yeah. those those three words, as you said, for, for your they role. Probably, I think put, they might talk, whether, they, whether I want to be perceived like that, I think that's probably what that's. Hey. <laughs> well listen my free would be a lot worse than that so if that's what they would say you've done quite well mm. but uh listen alex really appreciate your time i think a really fascinating insight just into i guess your world and some of the work that you do and also some of your experiences um in terms of being able to take away what that looks like in player potential and stuff so i know that we have drifted a little bit from some of the topics that we discussed previously but loads of amazing content in there so yeah thank you so much for your time and hopefully we can catch up again soon yeah, no, thank you very much. As I said, we've got a we've got an incredibly good team and uh, within our environment. So I think that makes my job down the pathway incredibly easy. Perfect. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.